Uh, depending on where you're calling from, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, welcome to the second of a three-part series on uh, this month's uh, gender focus events. Uh, today, it's our Gender Lens Investing Workshop. Uh, thank you for being here. We've intended it to be a smaller group. Um, we'd be very happy to also um, welcome you um, to the third installment, um, which will be next week. We shall send you the invites properly for that. Uh, but for today, again, welcome to the Gender Lens Investing Workshop. Um, before um, introducing Rebecca Fries, uh, CEO and founder of Value for Women, uh, let me just remind everybody that uh, we're using the gallery format, uh, which means to say that um, where we see everybody and uh, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but at the same time, if uh, you can observe uh, proper time to mute and unmute yourselves, uh, that would be most appreciated. Uh, on to introducing um, Rebecca Fries. Uh, we're very happy to be with her today. Uh, Rebecca, uh, I should say maybe to you, good, good evening. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, Rebecca is Managing Director and Founder of Value for Women. She has spearheaded the growth of the organization into a globally recognized leader in gender inclusive business practice. With over 20 years of global expertise, she leads Value for Women in efforts to design innovation for gender inclusion with investors, SMEs, banks, financial institutions, and development organizations, and corporate foundations. Under her leadership, the Value for Women team works globally in a collaborative, multidisciplinary manner, applying practical hands-on approaches to solve business and investment challenges with a gender and inclusion lens. This involves delivery of advisory services and the design of research, uh, training, and communications. Rebecca has also authored and led sector-changing research on the introspection of gender investment entrepreneurship and economic development across sectors such as sustainable energy, finance, agriculture, and entrepreneurship. Rebecca is frequently invited to speak as an industry expert in Asia, Africa, and the Americas. And certainly we're glad to have you today with us uh, in the Philippines, Rebecca, but certainly the group is not limited to people calling, calling from uh, Manila, Philippines. Um, so, I'll turn over to you, Rebecca, and uh, let us know if it's a good evening for you. Thank you so much, Arneel, for that uh, lovely uh, introduction. Um, I'd forgotten about some of those things that we do as an organization. I feel like you did part of my job for me, introducing value for women, so thank you. Um, and indeed, uh, over here on the side of the globe, uh, in New York City, where I am based, it is evening. Um, so, uh, but just really happy to, to be um, joining you all as you're starting your morning uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, thank you so much to AVPN for the invitation to come and to present this workshop um, and to all of you participants for, for joining us. Uh, we're, we're really excited. Um, to, to have all of you for the next uh, hour and a half. Um, my only regret is that we cannot see you in person this year. I know we had the pleasure of seeing many of you um, almost a year ago in person. Um, and my only regret is that we can't do that this year, but we're really excited for an interactive um, workshop on, on gender lens investing. Um, and maybe before I, I uh, introduce um, our team who will be uh, delivering uh, the, the workshop, um, just to say, uh, in addition to thank you to AVPN and to uh, the participants for joining us, uh, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about um, Value for Women and, and who we are um, as an organization. Um, so we are a global social enterprise uh, that believes uh, that women are key drivers of economic and social growth. Uh, and that women's inclusion is essential for better business and investment outcomes. That's really what, what drives our work as an organization. Um, uh, and part of our work is really offering advisory services, uh, tools and resources for investors, uh, for SMEs and other SME ecosystem actors uh, to really help them bring a gender lens in their practice. 
Um, our, our team's approach is very collaborative, bottom up and practical. Uh, and we're committed to designing new solutions and to drawing out innovation in the field of investment and business practice and to make gender inclusion easy and the norm over time. Um, to that end, we, we leverage often the, the business case uh, for inclusion in our work um, as a driver and um, believe that business, uh, gender in business and investment will lead to uh, not only better impacts, but also um, better profits and to sustainable long-term uh, resilient businesses. So that's really what drives our team uh, on the day-to-day. -day. Uh, and our team uh, working with the organizations that you can see a, kind of a, a, a uh, an example of the types of organizations we work with, um, which kind of span uh, different types. We um, are a multidisciplinary and, and global team uh, that works out of uh, Asia, Latin America, um, uh, the Americas in general, and Africa. Um, and uh, we're, we're really excited to, uh, that, that a big part of our work is um, uh, focused on building knowledge, uh, knowledge products, um, which we are excited to share with you today, both through this workshop um, and through our uh, new guide to gender lens investing, which we will um, be um, presenting the workshop around. Um, maybe just one last thing before I introduce um, our team. Uh, we're, we're really happy and pleased to, to partner with Investing in Women. Um, which where our efforts um, have really uh, focused on supporting uh, fund managers within Southeast Asia adopt a gender lens in practice, um, as well as on uh, sort of more field building, building and knowledge uh, exchange activities. Um, so with that, um, that's a little a teaser on who we are as Value for Women. Um, my role really today is going to be uh, to tee up uh, the rest of our Value for Women team um, who will be really uh, leading and driving uh, the workshop today. Uh, and I'll come back in uh, at a few different points as well later on in the conversation to introduce some of our other um, guest speakers that we have with us as well. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, now just introduce really quickly and hand the mic over to two of my colleagues. Um, Aparajita Agrawal uh, is based in India and she is uh, Value for Women's um, Director of Strategy and Development and leads the design of, of gender and business innovations at our organization. Um, she's, she's got over 18 years of experience on impact investing, uh, social entrepreneurship, and uh, developing strategic partnerships um, for investing and impact investing all over the globe. Uh, we also have Luis Marquez, um, who is originally from Mexico and currently based in Washington, DC. Um, he drives multiple initiatives. Um, I, I don't know how both of these uh, two sleep, actually. They drive so many different things uh, within our organization, um, including uh, research, uh, the design of gender lens investing tools, and uh, working with financial institutions, uh, impact investors, uh, and many others to create um, uh, supportive ecosystems for women-led businesses and also to uh, encourage gender practices within um, all businesses. Um, so with that, I will hand the mic over to uh, Aparajita. Thanks, Rebecca. Thank you. And good morning, good day, everyone. Uh, my name is Aparajita Agrawal and as Rebecca mentioned, I'm based out of India. Uh, it's still pretty early morning for me, so I'm sorry for, for this sore sort of morning throat. Um, I, I think what we'll start with is, is move on to uh, taking this poll, first of all, uh, firstly. Um, you'd see this come up on your screen, but there are two questions. We'll start with, uh, with both of them on the screen. Uh, the first question, for those of you who might not be able to read it on a mobile screen, is how would you rate your existing level of knowledge on gender lens investing? Uh, if you could select the phrase that best represents you, that'll be quite helpful. And the second question here is, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has complicated or delayed my organization's gender lens investing inclusion plans. And we'd love to hear if you agree or disagree with that. Um, we'll keep this up for a few seconds and for about 30, min uh, 30 seconds, I think. And then we'll see once we have all the responses. This is great. There is, there's already a diversity in this rather small group otherwise. Okay, so you all can possibly see the poll results. 
we have a few experts. Uh, we definitely have quite a few beginners who are thirsty for more. So that's great because that always makes up for great conversations. Um, and we do have a couple of people who say they don't know about GLI. So I guess we learn from their experience and they from us. Uh, to the second question, quite a few of you have been on the fence about uh, whether COVID-19 pandemic has complicated or delayed your plans, uh, but some of you, um, seven of you, I think, agree with this. And yeah, a total of 10 sort of agree. And there are a few who disagree. Great. I, I hope you can all see the results. And with that, I'm going to move quickly to talking about what we'll cover today. Um, so in today's workshop, we are going to cover about what gender lens investing really is, and we'll take a bit of a practitioner's approach to it, talking about how we see practitioners um, implement this in their organizations. We have um, an amazing lineup. We have two of our um, valued partners and speakers, um, Goldie from Maine, Philippines, and uh, Lee from Calvert Impact Capital. They'll both bring a, bring a ringside view of what, what exactly does it take to, um, to talk about gender lens investing and implement it. Um, and we'll also talk about how you can do it, the ability to identify multiple entry points, as well as what this looks like by listening to these examples that are related to investment practice in diverse sectors. Uh, we'll finally also have a participatory exercise where, where you can talk about what you can do. Um, and, and we will close with some good observations from all of you on this. Um, in terms of the agenda, what we have uh, for us today is, um, as, as you can probably see on your screens, we'll um, set the expectations, we'll talk about what gender lens investing is, where Luis and I and Rebecca will, will spend a bit of time. Uh, we'll talk about why you should invest with the gender lens. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, we have two speakers who will talk about how they have actually done this and, and where are their challenges, um, what kind of challenges have they seen and what kind of uh, incentives have we seen while they invest with the gentle lens. Um, we'll wrap it up with, uh, on, on the talking side, with talking about uh, how do you actually apply gentle lens in the investment process based on what our speakers have, have talked to us about. And we'll spend about 20 minutes in a participatory activity um, before we close. Um, so that's, that's, for, uh, that's for the session. And um, I'm just going to say that we will try and make this as participatory as possible. So we'd love to use, we'll be using more polls. So you'll see questions popping up every now and then. And it'll be great to get feedback from all of you. Uh, please use the chat box liberally, send your questions on the chat. Um, if you have specific observations for speakers, feel free to send them, um, send them direct chat messages as well. But please um, note that while they're speaking, they might not have an eye on the chat box. Uh, as a team, we'll make sure we respond to as many of these as possible. And uh, in our recap, we'll try to address uh, what we might not be able to address on chat. Um, so with that, I think we can, we can probably get into the meat of the discussion. And talk about what really is gender lens investing. Uh, so our objective today is to introduce the framework and uh, the entry points for, for gentle lens investing. Um, and at this point, um, you know, I'd like to invite Luis, my colleague who's based out of the US. Um, Luis, would you come, uh, come in? Yes, hi, everybody. So I just uh, told you, if you feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. And, uh, uh, and, and while you do that, let's take another poll. Um, so, the question is, gender lens investing refers to investing in enterprises laid by women. True or false? We need a uh, Jeopardy music. So we'll just leave it on a couple more seconds. A lot of you are answering. Some of you are thinking it through. Okay, great. So not quite a 50-50 split, but uh, you know, almost 60-40. So 50% 60 of you think it's false uh, and some of you think it's true. And you can imagine that this is a bit of a trick question. Um, and it's, uh, and we'll talk about that. So 
Um, gender lens investing does refer to investing in enterprises uh, led by women, but not just that. So let's talk about what, what it means. Um, for us, a value for women, gender lens investing is the deliberate incorporation of gender factors into investment analysis and decision making to improve social and business outcome, em, out, outcomes, emphasis on the improving social and business outcomes. Um, we don't just want to think about gender in our decision making uh, for the sake of it. We, we, um, there, there's a reason we want to do it. And um, okay, so now thinking about uh, you know this issue that we, we we did this trick question for, which is okay. So what is gender lens investing? Well, for us, it's also uh, it is investing in women and women-led businesses, and that's very important. But it's not just about that. Um, it's also about investing in businesses that intentionally uh, provide products and services that disproportionately impact women, um, businesses that intentionally uh, seek to promote gender diversity in the firm, not just that they happen to be hiring women, um, and uh, and also uh, businesses that intentionally seek to um, uh, include more women and women-led businesses as suppliers and uh, distri distributors. So I'm gonna use, you, you can't, you might not all be able to see my video well, but I have some gummy bears here. And the gummy bears, the red ones represent men and the green ones represent women. So if these are, this is the Southeast Asia investment ecosystem where we got about 9% of venture capital and private equities going to women led businesses. So part of what gender lens investing is about is about getting a lot more green women I don't know why they're green into the uh, to get investment, but then it's also about working with everybody, men, women, uh, to uh, to promote gender equality in their business models in each of these three lenses we talked about. Um, okay, so that's that's what it is. So how to do it? So with investing in women, we uh, we 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 created a how-to guide for uh, gender lens investing. Um, where we define three entry points. And uh, the first entry point um, is providing capital. So basically providing financing for businesses that are, uh, you know, that are either led by women or, are, or have one of the lenses that we've, we just described. Um, but then it's also about thinking about the investment process. Um, from you know from selection and deal origination all the way to impact and exit, and thinking about and mitigating biases throughout the process and find, identifying opportunities to promote gender equality. And finally, it's about walking the talk. So gender diversity within the firm, um, in general, but particularly in for investment officers and uh, general partners, we basically also want there, we want there to be more gender diversity in the people making the investment decisions. Um, and so um, and so these are the three entry points to think about if you're an investor and what you can do, uh, uh, how you can uh, apply a gender lens. Okay, so what's it all for? Why, why do we do this? Um, well, one thing we wanna do is women-led businesses and, and social enterprises when we're talking about impact investing, grow and thrive. That's what we want. We want them to grow and thrive. Gender forward businesses, which are businesses that intentionally uh, apply the lenses that we mentioned, also grow and thrive. And then we also want more businesses and investors to achieve gender equality within their own workforce. Um, and so what's the longer term impact that we're looking for is, well, we want more investments to directly address gender inequalities and women's empowerment. We want positive shifts in gender norms. So we want to change not only what we invested, but how we invest. And then, uh, and then eventually we want better business outcomes and, uh, and improve social impact. Um, and again, please write, please write any questions you may have in the chat box and we might not get, we, we might get to the questions at different points, um, but please go ahead and write them and we'll try to uh, answer them either through the chat or in the presentation. Um, okay, so what might this look like, right? So we're gonna give you two, quick examples of what these investments look like and then and then our different speakers are gonna tell you even more. So we know, uh, particularly with COVID, um, that uh, there's there's a new, the digital, digital skills are very important for the future of jobs, right? 21st century jobs, uh, 
also called the fourth industrial revolution. So knowledge intensive jobs, particularly those that, uh, that are in STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, and math um, are becoming more important. And uh, a study by the World, World Economic Forum uh, looked at that and, and found that women stand to lose more from these new jobs uh, than men, right? So more women stand to lose jobs in, as, as we shift the way, uh, the way of work. Um, we also have this gender digital gap in Southeast Asia and throughout emerging markets um, on the awareness, accessibility, and willingness uh, uh, to use digital, uh, with regards to digital technology uh, and, and, um, and access to, to the internet. Um, so, okay, and COVID-19 is exacerbating all of these trends. So. Um, what are some businesses doing? So I have an example from Africa, actually. Um, there's an Africa US company um, called Andela. And what they do is they basically find the top talent from across the, the, the continent and they, they train them, they upskill them, and then they, they, they on, on programming and technology skills, and then they link them to global companies so they provide them with a job. And then there's a business model around that. Um, but from the beginning, they set out to have a 50% target of women. Now that might seem simple, but when you're uh, when you're looking at graduates from STEM fields being 20, 30%, having a 50% target um, of top students in Africa is not an easy feat, right? So there's a lot of work that goes into that. And another reason, so this is how uh, some companies are redressing it. And the reason I mentioned them is because they were the first investment of the Zuckerberg uh, Foundation, the the Facebook uh, Facebook Foundation, and um, and so there's a lot of boot camps in Southeast Asia and uh, that are also looking at this issue, uh, but I mentioned them because there's real money going towards uh, solving these issues. And now Perdita is gonna tell you about one more example. Thanks, Lois. Um, I'm going to talk about Thermalife, which is an enterprise based out of India, but also working in Africa. They are a partner of Shell Foundation here. And um, this example is from looking at the value chain uh, and how um, we've helped them with the post-investment support in, in their value chain. Um, we supported Thermalife to help women sales agents who were selling clean energy products door to door overcome mobility constraints that limited their sale potentials. We uh, brought in a gender lens to analyze the sales force. Uh, we piloted new strategies for sales that help women overcome these constraints. Um, the adjusted sales strategy saw an increase in sales by the women agents, uh, and in some cases it went up um, to about 80% in sales for women agents. Um, this is now being scaled by Dharma Life uh, that has over 60,000 sales agents across India. And I think this is a pretty good example, especially in the region, looking at uh, how sales and marketing are considered typically as, as very sort of male dominated or dominant functions. Um, and especially in countries like India where women aren't easily accepted into those roles unless they are only selling to women in, in, in smaller uh, informal setups. Um, I think uh, what it also um, showed us is how you can actually apply this practically and, and implement this. I'm sure some of you would have similar examples to share from your own portfolio or your work. Uh, so we'd love to hear about them. Feel free to talk about them uh, in, in the chat window as well. Um, moving on, and let's talk about why should we invest with a gender lens? And again, we'll, we'll come up with a couple of poll questions here. Uh, so we'd love to talk about, um, we'd love to ask you um, a question specifically around Philippines and then about East Asia. Uh, so in the first question, we'd love to know in the Philippines, what percent of people agree that if jobs are scarce, um, men have more right to a job than women. Uh, and we'd love to hear opinions on this. Uh, and the second question focuses on um, whether gender diverse firms in East Asia had a certain increase in IRR relative to the median. I hope you can see the questions on your screens. Thank you, we can see the responses coming in. We'll have the results up in a few seconds. Okay. 
I hope you can see the results. So this is quite interesting. We see that uh, most of you have mentioned that I guess 35 percent, 45 percent have mentioned that uh, people in, in even in the Philippines, uh, a large percentage of people agree that men have more of a right to a job than a women in when jobs are scarce. And in the second one, in the second question, as you can see, uh, 12 percent of you have uh, have said that there's an increase in IRR relative to the medium in, in gender diverse forms. So we can we can unpack this a little bit more when we go into the participatory discussions. Um, we're gonna move into, uh, into the, onto the next slide, talking about the myths. And Luis, I think this is the point I handed back to you. Yeah, so we'll, we'll tell you the answer. We're not just leaving you hanging. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go through two myths that we hear a lot in answering this one of these questions that you that you just answered. So one one myth that we hear a lot, is, particularly from investors, we don't discriminate, right? Or we don't have bias. Um, so let's unpack that a little bit. So the answer you've been waiting for. So it, it was actually 75% of men and women in the Philippines think that uh, when jobs are scarce, men should have more right to a job than women. Why do we mention this? The Philippines is a shining beacon in the region uh, and normally seen as an example of where there's been a lot of progress in gender equality. Uh, as many of you know, there's been recent uh, changes to the parental leave law. And so a lot of times we hear, oh, well, you know, we're doing great, we're done, right? But then we see stats like this, but it doesn't have to be this way, right? We even see some, some differences with, with some, uh, some other countries in the region, um, different countries, but still, um, and so this shows us, well, you know, there's explicit bias, right? This is explicit bias and it has its reasons and that's alive and well. And so there's still work and that explicit bias seeps into society, into work, into investing. Um, but there's also what we call hidden bias when we, when, uh, and that's, um, that comes out in, in evaluation and pitching. And that's not just in Southeast Asia, that's in the United States and a lot of developed markets. So, uh, for example, a uh, few studies have looked at the type of questions that you uh, that that men and women get asked when pitching to VCs, and um, women tend to get more, asked more questions about uh, personal questions about how they were going to balance this with you know with their home life, for example, whereas men get asked more uh, questions about the vision and the strategy and the growth of the firm, right? So there's a bias in the type of questions, obviously, in the types of answers that you're going to get. Um, and we see this also with partners that we're working with. Uh, investors are still asking us, for example, well, you know, if we invest in women-led startups, what if they get pregnant, right? It's particularly at early stage, right? So what if they get pregnant? And then, um, you know, then I don't want to invest in them because what if they, you know, they'll get pregnant. So these are issues that we hear about to this day. And um, obviously our, our message is that is not a reason to discriminate any, any, you know, if there's, if there's a good professional or a good entrepreneur, a good idea and a good business that you want to invest in, um, any man or woman leading that business is going to figure out how to, you know, get that business ahead. Um, so anyway, so these are some issues that are, are still ingrained and, and still something to deal with. Now I'll probably do that back to you. Thanks, Luis. I think the second myth we, we've often heard a gender lens investing in businesses is driven by social versus business or investment outcomes. And, and this is again, um, you know, one thing that's uh, quite real in, in usual conversations uh, here in India as well. And I, I, I gather it won't be very different for uh, East Asia, um, where when we start talking about investing in women businesses, they the assumption is that it's a nonprofit or it's it's not necessarily a, a business that's driven by targets and, and investment mandates. Um, I, I think it's, it's good to, at this point to think about the gender diversity in leadership teams. And I'm going to talk about that in the next slide a bit more. Um, Gender diverse firms in East Asia we've seen have had 18% increase in IRR related to the median and this goes back to the question we had uh, posted in the poll earlier. 8.6% um, versus 4.4% ROE for companies in the Calvert Impact 
capital portfolio have a higher percentage of women in leadership compared to those with a lower percentage. Um, and, and this is some data that has come out of, uh, out of researchers as well. So it's definitely something to reflect upon as uh, many of you who are in investing roles look at building portfolios or intermediaries that are part of this group, look at supporting uh, building women diverse or diverse teams in leadership in the organizations that you support. Um, we're going to talk about solutions for women presenting a huge market opportunity and, and quite a few of us who practice gender lens investing or work closely in that have seen that um, the finance gap for women led MSMEs in, in East Asia is about $2.3 trillion. Uh, and that's a huge market for, for anybody to look at. Global femtech market, femtech is what we um, refer to as female technology. It's, it's, uh, it's referring to software, diagnostic products, services that use technology to improve women's health. Um, femtech typically involves the use of digital health interventions to motivate patients to access and use applications for managing women's health issues. In, in just the globe, in the global femtech market, we know that this is expected to grow from USD uh, 25 billion to about 50 billion by, two, uh, by 2026. And recently because of COVID uh, mask, uh, you know, the lack of COVID mask itself that are designed for women uh, has shown that women-centered design can lead to new market uh, product opportunities. We see this not just in masks, we see this in, in all kinds of medical equipment that are made for, uh, for the male staff, not necessarily customized for either by, you know, as simple as not customized based on sizes, not customized based on body type uh, for women, whereas we see a, a large part of the healthcare workforce being women increasingly in, in all countries. Um, Solution for women, as we also see, lead to greater economic development. Uh, we see that if women participated in the economy, matching the rate of improvement of fastest uh, improving countries in their region, the global GDP would increase substantially above what can be achieved at current rates of progress towards gender parity. Um, on a per capita basis, this means that gender inequality in earnings could lead to losses in wealth of $23,620 per person globally. And I think this loss in human capital wealth due to gender inequality is estimated at this point to run to about 160 trillion. So uh, I think the data points are there for all of us to see. And, I, and, and while many of us may not necessarily be working in this kind of macroeconomic um, areas, but I think it's still, that change begins at, at, the, at the grassroots, at the very base level of working with enterprises that encourage or working with communities that enable better gender parity and, and better inclusion practices, uh, because a lot of these businesses will grow and, and impact the economies in their own countries. Um, in East Asia, uh, we see that solutions driven by women do require more investments, as is the case in most of the world. But in East Asia alone, women-led businesses receive only 9% of venture capital and private equity funding. Um, this uh, is coming from IFC data. So um, fairly, I think, uh, fairly, fairly close to what uh, the reality would be. Um, we see that this is the right thing to do because women and men are, are not on a level playing field. So there are serious, there is a serious need for interventions at every level to create gender equality, not just because, yes, it is a human right, but also because data points us to the fact that this is uh, better socially, this is better economically, and this is better for uh, the growth of countries and the world. So, um, so absolutely, um, absolutely something we should all be mindful about, not just, as we said, not just from a social lens, but also from a pure economic investment decision point of view. Um, there is a solid case for gender lens investing, um, a solid business case for it. Uh, we know that solutions driven by women present a significant market opportunity. We've seen it in this current ongoing pandemic of how catering to, um, to women who uh, project choices, who define uh, purchase choices, who, who present a big part of the healthcare workforce, for example, how, how they themselves are, could be a potentially big market uh, and are underfinanced. Uh, we see that this is in sectors like finance, healthcare, technology, um, solutions for women, um, again, presents a very huge market opportunity. Um, we know that gender diversity in startups improves 
performance. Uh, we've seen where teams are more gender diverse. There, um, there is uh, better retention. There is better growth in in companies. Uh, we see that investors. Um, are increasingly finding these businesses or are encouraging investees to invest and diversify, invest in their leadership and diversify them. Um, and again, gender diversity at the investor level itself improves performance and helps investment firms and networks to spot new and different opportunities. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand over back to Rebecca. Please keep your comments coming in on chat. Um, and I, I see that uh, somebody has requested for a copy of the presentation as well. So uh, perhaps the AVPN team can guide us, but I think the presentation would be available, the recording of this would be available uh, to all those registered. Back to you, Excellent. Rebecca. Thank you. Thanks so much, Aparjita and Louise. Um, so we're at the point in our uh, morning evening um, where we have the pleasure of introducing two, uh, two of our guest speakers, um, which uh, I, I can start off introducing Goldie and then um, we'll move into to Goldie's presentation and then I'll, I'll take the mic back and, and introduce Lee. Um, so the, the purpose of really bringing in uh, external speakers is to, to really, as, as Luis and Aparjito were, were saying, is to have you hear from investors who are, who are doing this in practice and hear a little bit more about their motivations, their journeys, what they're doing and what they're seeing. Um, so uh, firstly, we have uh, Goldie Yancha, who is the Impact Investing Partnerships Manager of Maine, the Manila Angel Investing Network. Um, Value for Women has had the pleasure of working with Maine uh, for about a year now uh, on their gender lens investing journey, and we're really excited to, to hear more about that from you, Goldie. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, we know that Goldie has uh, uh, over a decade of experience working specifically in technology and uh, social impact driven organizations um, with specific experience rolling out digital products, running uh, business accelerator programs for technology startups and impact uh, driven ventures. Um, so Goldie, I will hand it over to you. I think we'll take about five to seven minutes for you and then we'll open it up for a couple of minutes of Q&A. Um, and we would just encourage all the participants to plop their questions into the chat box so that we can um, uh, uh, rush right into the Q&A. Goldie, over to you. Great. Thank you for your kind um, introduction, Rebecca. And it was really great to learn from the insights that Arajita and Lewis um, shared earlier uh, that resonates a lot with you know, the, the, the work that we do and the motivations of, of why we're, we're in this journey to, to enable more diversity in investments um, and the investors that we have. Um, let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so so maybe to, to share some context you now of um, you know um, main and why um, the organization Angel invests. Um, if we look um, and and, and uh, realize the innovations that that we're using as consumers um, that define. Um, you know, the, the, the environment now, um, it's been a constant evolution of disruption and the more relevant innovations that um, are able to cater to um, the market's needs and people's needs, right? And so, you know, when we think of this, we can think about, you know, how we used to consume music, right? It's like we first maybe started with vinyl and then cassettes and CDs and MP3 players and now we're streaming. It's, it's a constant evolution and people who have done these innovations and solutions started out from somewhere. Um, and that's the power of uh, early stage financing and how that enables these solutions to get off the ground. Um, for every business, um, it is important for them to be able to access uh, this kind of financing and angel investors play a pivotal uh, role in being able to get these compelling solutions off the ground. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so um, with Maine, we're a fairly young organization, um, but it is the most um, active um, angel investment network in the Philippines. Um, we're approaching 100 members um, that has fortunately allowed us to deploy over a million dollars annually. Um, since Maine's inception, um, 
we're glad to be able to have um, invested in 11 startups. Um, and apart from providing investment funding is um, being able to provide advice and of course connections to help these businesses uh, grow and optimize their potential. Um, and so the investment thesis of uh, the membership in Maine is really focusing on um, businesses at their early stage um, who have high growth um, business models that use uh, technology as a differentiator. And so, you know, as a relatively young um, entrepreneurship ecosystem, um, this is the organization's contribution in being able to grow and realize a more uh, robust um, entrepreneurial ecosystem in the Philippines. Next. Um, some of Maine's investments to date, uh, maybe just mentioning some um, who have we've seen um, grow um, since the time we've met them. Um, one startup is Kumo, a streaming app um, enabling deep engagement with online communities for Filipinos all over, all over the world and allowing brands to have a deeper engagement level with them. Um, Quickwire is a cross-border payments platform, uh, currently focusing on the real estate industry um, and have, has grown a lot in the years as well. Um, and Maine's latest investment is actually in a women-led business, uh, Fortuna, which is basically coolers uh, used by fish farmers that just make food fresher, make our environment better and leave our fishermen with, with better, better incomes. I think um, next week for AVP and Deal Share Live, uh, Tamara Meckler, who is the co-founder of Fortuna, will also be presenting uh, more about her business. So that do check that out if that is of interest. Next. Um, so you know some context about you know our thinking of you know why we um, partook this journey of gender lens investing. Um, I think our partners in value for women hit the nail on the head on where we are, what the gaps are, and where the compelling opportunities are. Um, with Maine and its focus on tech startups, um, you know, looking, I used to do a fellowship with um, Mass Challenge, and this is the data that, that they have. They would accelerate um, more than 100 startups every year, right? And looking at the data set, they saw that um, uh, gender diverse teams actually uh, derived um, higher value, uh, but would not have um, enough investments funneled into, into them. Um, and so this represents a big gap, a big missed opportunity. Um, and I think earlier there was mentioned that in East Asia, only 9% um, of um, investments are made into women-led businesses, right? Um, but there's so much um, evidence and studies there that um, gender diverse teams actually deliver better business outcomes. So, you know, knowing this and realizing this, you know, with the partners that we work with, hey, you know, let's take advantage of um, what we're missing out on. Um, and so next slide. Um, that's kind of how you know, our thinking has been in our commitment to um, undertaking the, this gender lens um, investing initiative. And so we've partnered with investing in women. Um, and, and through that, we've been doing work with Value for Women and, and learning a lot um, along the way as we um, endeavor to diversify and expand our um, membership, our investor members. Um, and also um, diversify our investments, right? So, so globally, the, the gap is huge. We're, we're not less than 9%, but we're not more than 50%. So there is a, a lot of work to be done in um, diversifying our um, investor member pool. And it, it, just really, it just really makes a lot of sense to incorporate more diversity in perspective. So we're able to uh, properly funnel um, these investments and you know take advantage of the missed not only financial opportunities but also 
um, better social outcomes at large. And so, so this is what drives us um, at Maine. And um, so maybe my final slide or, or call to action. Um, if there are people in the room who would love to engage with us and be part of Maine, uh, we, we invite you to, to reach out. Um, we can be contacted through invest at Maine at PH. Um, also happy to collaborate with other organizations to uh, push this movement forward um, and also work and um, engage with other women-led businesses. Uh, thanks again to our partners at uh, V4W and for AVPN um, in having us over. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Goldie. That was uh, fantastic and a really great snapshot of the, the great work that, that Maine is, is doing. Um, we're going to um, jump right over to Lee and if we have time after Lee, we'll have Q&A for both um, speakers. So please keep your questions coming in um, and we will do our best to respond either um, uh, through Q&A or over the chat afterwards if we don't have enough time. Um, so yeah, I am uh, super excited to introduce Lee Moran, uh, who is the Director of Strategy at Calvert Impact Capital. Um, Lee uh, and her colleagues at Calvert are driving force in the gender lens investing field, and we're just really excited uh, to be able to hear uh, from you today, Lee. So I'm going to hand the mic right over to you. Excellent, and I'll move quickly so we can get to Q&A, because I know there's a lot of great questions that are already popping up on the chat. So thank you, Rebecca. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you to AVPN for, for hosting this event, for having me today. Like Rebecca said, I wish I was there in person, but thrilled to be here online with everyone as well. And briefly, I'll just say that gender is really important to our work at Calvert Impact Capital. And what we're really focused on is moving gender lens from sort of a niche, nice to have idea to something that is mainstream and just a part of good investing. We know that when women are valued, they have much more power and influence over the broader economy as Luis and our project have laid out. And that when gender data is considered that better investment decisions are made. So I'm gonna walk you through our gender lens investing strategy and sort of what we did in the beginning, which we have evolved a lot um, over the past about decade as we've been implementing our gender lens. Because I think one of the best things that we learned and that we try and share with other investors is that there's no one right way to do gender lens investing. And it's a strategy that should be sort of continually iterative and, and evolving and incorporating lessons learned as you move along. So now we look at gender across our entire portfolio. We say we use it as a lens to see risk and opportunity more clearly. And we also use it as a lever to pull for greater social impact. But just to put that in context, to briefly introduce Calvert Impact Capital, we are a nonprofit impact investing firm. We are investing debt into private markets. So really connecting capital with communities that are often overlooked or underserved by traditional finance. And so every investment that we make at Calvert Impact Capital has an intentional and measurable social or environmental impact in addition to a financial return. Our work is global. It spans about nine sectors, everything from small business and affordable housing to renewable energy, health, education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one important thing that, that I think is good for context for our gender lens investing strategy is that we act almost like a fund of funds. So we lend to funds and intermediaries who are then on lending to businesses in place. Um, and you know, really as longtime investors in the community development sector and in the microfinance sector, we've always invested in women since our founding 25 years ago. We know that women are good investments for their families, for their communities, for society at large. And our own experience has really borne that out. And if we could move to the next slide, Luis. But in 2012, we adopted a much more formal approach to gender lens investing. So not just the idea that we were investing in women, but really, again, which we know is not, is not all that gender lens is limited to. Um, but we really decided to take a more a different, more proactive approach. And what we started to do um, was screen potential deals for gendered impact and inclusiveness and create a specific portfolio around gender lens investing or high gendered impact investments. And we created specific metrics to track our progress as well. And so we set up three screens for inclusion in the portfolio. And that was when um, to be included, a, a borrower had to have the women led, have at least 50% of women in leadership or 50% women clients or a special program that was really focused on women in some way, shape or form. And we executed that strategy and we built a really diverse global portfolio. Um, again, from affordable housing to small business lending in the US, microfinance in Southeast Asia, clean cookstoves in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we had two really key learnings from that. The first was that 
the impact was really inspiring, but as we analyzed the data, it was really hard to know if we were really moving the needle anywhere. Um, and it was hard to create a coherent strategy because the data really wasn't comparable. And the second important lesson that we learned, and this was really the key one that has driven a lot of our strategy going forward, is that our screens were too tight. So we were screening out really highly impactful deals simply because our screens were too narrow and they didn't have the type of nuance and, uh, and approach that we needed to really build a strong gendered strategy. So we realized that we were eliminating some really, really powerful deals and entire sectors from our gender strategy simply because those screens were too tight. And where we really learned this was with the off-grid renewable energy sector. So a lot of the off-grid renewable energy deals that we were looking at in the sector were, um, were heavily invested in right now is uh, didn't make, make it through those initial three screens because on paper, um, the, solar, the solar space looked like they were only serving male clients because most of the men signed the contracts for solar products. And that's what was reported back to us from borrowers in that space. It's also heavily dominated by male employees, um, but it was something we knew having learned a lot more about the sector and diving in that um, has a really strong impact on women and is, is a transformative impact on the lives of women and girls, especially um, and so it became clear that we really needed to change our criteria and our approach to gender lens investing entirely to reflect more nuance and to understand that impact over time. And so what we do now is we say our, our gender lens strategy is both wide and deep. Wide in the sense that we collect gender specific across our entire portfolio for every single deal that we do for all of our investments. But we also go deep in each sector to really understand where our capital and the need for our capital intersects with the potential to make a difference for women's lives at scale. And renewable energy is really the first sector we've explored quite deeply with that lens. So we can go to the next slide now, Luis. So this is really just a, a way to highlight our process here. As I said, gender is quite nuanced and contextual and strategy should really reflect that. Um, and so your gender lens strategy will look different depending on the type of capital you have, um, you know, and depending on how much you have, depending on where that capital lives, depending on the region and the sector that you're working on, and depending on the spe spe specific impact you might be focused on achieving. Um, really, and at the center of all of those things, it's where you, your strategy should be born out of. Um, and if you look to the right, you can see that, you know, our screens have really evolved and we don't even really use the word screen anymore. <laughs> what we say is we screen in rather than screen out. And we found that's a much more effective way to do gender lens investing for us because our goal is not to create the most sort of clean gender portfolio. We've also realized that working with borrowers um, to enhance their understanding and their approach to gender lens investing is where we can have a huge, huge impact. So rather what we try and do now is really meet people where they are. And again, sort of bring them up the curve of understanding how gender can be a real asset and, and should be incorporated into their, their core business operations, not as a special program or something extra. Um, so we set expectations for reporting gender disaggregated data for with all of our borrowers, knowing that it won't be perfect. I think that's something we really like to emphasize is that it can take a year, it can take a couple of years for borrowers to get really um, quite good at collecting good gender disaggregated data. Um, we also set milestones with them based on where they are. And these can be formal, they can be a part of the loan agreement, they can be a side agreement. There's many different ways to do this. Um, and if you move to the next slide, Luis, I think there's an example of our, oh, this is just a, a little bit of an example of that, sort of the, some of the metrics we collect. Oh, one slide up, sorry. Yep, so some of the metrics that we collect and you can see how we collect gender disaggregated data, just mostly on sort of leadership and um, basically on clients served. It's a base metric for all of our clients. We do offer um, all our borrowers, we do work with borrowers to get more granular and specific after that, as if they're able to meet sort of these needs. And these are just some sample milestones that we also work with some of our borrowers on. Again, depending on their context, it could be adding additional women to the board or your investment committee ensuring that proper HR practices are in place, et cetera, things like that. Um, and what we've seen in our experience is that borrowers who are really even reluctant to call themselves gender lens investors or even talk about it are now sort of sending us their gender lens strategies to review. Um, so it is really a process. And I would like to, to emphasize that, that it's something, it's not a light switch moment. It's something that takes um, time to work with. Um, and so if you move to the next slide, Luis. 
Thank you. So this is just one example of a bar we worked with again in the renewable energy sector who was quite reluctant to even really engage with us on, on gender lens investing despite being a really diverse team themselves and having a diverse client base. But as we really pushed them to start to look at where gender and impact impacted their business, where they decided to start with the data that they had on their own staff, their sales staff. And what they realized when they started to analyze that was that the women were outperforming the men by a significant amount. And that caused them to sort of dig into why is that happening? And what they realized was it was part of the sales process that, or, or how they theorized on it was that women were able to approach homes and speak to women in a way that male sales agents weren't. And it was much more effective that way because the women um, were actually driving a lot of the decision-making for purchasing these solar home systems. Um, and so it really caused them to sort of unpack a lot of assumptions that they had made about their business and see where gender could really influence um, actual operations. And so they committed to collecting better data. As a result, they made changes to their operations and their sales strategy, which has resulted in not only more sales, but more reliable customers. So if we move to the next slide, I'll wrap up here and just say a few of our lessons learned again over the past 10 years of evolving our own gender lens investing strategy is really, are really just summed up here. And they can be summed up as again, gender is quite contextual and quite nuanced. It makes sense to set realistic expectations based on the type of capital that you have. If you're an equity investor versus a debt investor, you're gonna have different levels of influence and different levers that you can pull with your clients. Um, so it's important to understand sort of the tools that you're able to use that reflect that type of capital and relationship that you have as well. Um, and one of the biggest things I think about gender lens investing that value will for women does so well and that AVPN is really providing the space here for is to begin a conversation. Um, the more the gender is talked about as a normal part of the investment process, normal data to collect, a normal question to ask, the further the field can uh, really catch up and adopt and, and start, start benefiting from all of the, the amazing insights that gender can bring. So I'd really encourage everyone to be open and to, to talk about gender lens investing. You don't have to have a perfect strategy because there is no perfect strategy. Um, the, you know, again, there's no one right way to do it. And the only wrong way to do it is to ignore gender entirely. So with that, I will conclude and turn it over to Q&A, Rebecca. Thanks so much, Lee. That was speedy. Um, I think we've covered a lot of a lot so far, and we have a lot of really uh, fantastic questions coming in um, through the chat box. So, I think we have time for two questions, and then we're going to have to move to the next section so that we can cover everything. Um, maybe I will start with a question for Lee. Um, just sort of working backward on my way up. Um, are the specific sectors and themes uh, that are better, are there, I think this is to, are there specific sectors or themes that are better levers for gender outcomes when assessing GLI opportunities, i.e. education, uh, financial inclusion, land rights, advocacy? Um, so we'll take that one. Do you wanna take that question, Lee? And then we'll ask one more from the list. Yeah, I think one thing to remember about gender is that, um, you know, it's ubiquitous, right? It's there whether you acknowledge it or not. It's a part of every single sector and a part of every single deal that you can do. It's much more obvious in certain sectors than others, but I think it's it's ever present um, in all deals that you can do. And I think that, you know, so, so I'll say that I, I think there, again, are particular sectors or themes where or perhaps there's industries that are, are really, um, you know, female dominated that I think people tend to associate more with um, with gender lens investing. I think for a long time, people just equivocated it with, as the question had in the beginning here, that gender lens investing is investing in women-led businesses or women small businesses that got very associated with microfinance, right? But I think it's important to um, really look for gender outside of the places where it's obvious because that's where you can really have um, quite, uh, quite an impact, where I think it's important to be careful about gender um, influences making sure that um, when you're talking about gender lens investing, we're talking about investing. Um, and I think that's more of a uh, confusion sometimes between what topics are appropriate for philanthropy versus what prep topics are appropriate for investment. And I think that's an important distinction to, to keep in mind as well. 
Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lee. And um, just a, a quick note, everyone can keep their questions coming in and we'll try to respond and have the uh, speakers respond over chat um, to the unresolved questions. Uh, maybe one more uh, uh, for you, Goldie, uh, from Ernest. How has your GLI investments impacted the enterprises so far? And what are your sustainability indicators when you invest in these enterprises? Maybe that could be a question for both Goldie and Lee, just to chime in on, because uh, I, I think you both um, are working in different ways with enterprises. Right. Um, thanks for the question. So uh, really what we look at is, you know, the, the makeup of uh, leadership. So it's, you know, how the capitalization looks like, cap, cap table, um, the management, um, organizational structure, um, and also even the board. Right. In terms of um, sustainable sustainability indicators with regards to that, um, especially with uh, follow-on capital inf uh, infusion, um, that is kind of one of the things that we track um, to, to see um, and um, ensure that we're able to ma maintain that diversity. Because especially in, in startups, uh, there is um, a dynamism in um, the follow-on funding and also the ownership. And so um, that would be the indicators that we track. Uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, um, and and just briefly from our perspective, again, we're we're lenders, um, so we are are making sure, um, first of all, to all investments that we make, that they're able to pay us back, um, so we can pay our investors back, right? Um, I think that we, I think our our investment capital, um, you know, is all lent with the intent of, of what we say build, grow, and sustaining organizations, depending on where they are in. Um, in a development sort of timeline. Um, we look to really sort of build uh, smaller organizations that have business models they're trying to prove out, maybe leaping from philanthropy to, to more commercial capital. We look to grow organizations that have a proven business model and need to expand and then sustain ones that are, that are quite large and operating well and, and maybe moving into a new sector or, or just need um, um, capital really at scale. And we do all of that with a gender lens. So it's infused into all of our work. Um, and, and is just naturally sort of a part of, of, of how we work with our borrowers. Um, and again, we're, we're looking for sustainability for, for all of them, where I think we really have had an impact with a lot of them is again, by just starting this conversation um, around gender with them, because um, some of our borrowers who have really great gendered impacts um, uh, might not have acknowledged it or might not have thought of it as anything special. So once they do start to think about it, then, you know, then they can take a sort of a step back or think about how gender really does incorporate into their strategy. And like the example I had in my slide um, earlier, they can think about how it can impact and improve their business. Um, and I think that's been one of our, our stronger impacts. Um, one of the other things that we are able to do with our borrowers is because we have looked at our own portfolio and we've analyzed our uh, portfolio over about a decade, looking at the relationship between financial performance and diversity at the leadership level. We are able to use that data as a point with a lot of our, our borrowers to say, we've looked at our own portfolio in investments just like you. And we've seen that there is um, a positive relationship between gender diversity and leadership and financial performance. And so we're able to use that to nudge borrowers a little bit um, as well, which I think is, is, is um, an important thing to be able to do with data that speaks to uh, people in, in context. Fantastic. Um, thank you both so much. I know we're, we're really tight on time. And um, so I, I think we'll wrap it up here. I would just maybe encourage um, both of our, our uh, speakers to respond to some outstanding questions over chat, if that's okay for the next few minutes. Um, and hopefully we can get all of those resolved. Um, and please feel free to, to reach out to both Goldie and Lee um, over email. Uh, their email addresses are shared, uh, were shared in the above slides and, and we'll put them in the chat as well. Um, thank you both so much. I know there's so much more you could say and we really uh, put you to the test to, 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 to keep it to the highlights. So thank you so much for that. And um, I am aware also that Lee for you, it's quite late. And so we will release you <laughs> as well um, as, as needed, but just thank you so much uh, to both of you for joining us and for sharing um, your, your gender lens uh, perspectives and journeys uh, with us. So with that, I'll pass it back over to Aparjita. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks, Lee and Goldie. Uh, feel free to respond to some of the messages, as Rebecca suggested on, on the chat. Um, but I, I come at this point to the quick 
check-in question and you'll see this pop up on your screen. How is everybody feeling? Ah, there's one sleepy head there. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I see the energy levels are still high. I think it's, it's, it's good to have a lot of people from Asia. At this point, we are smack in the middle of our day. Great. I think we have the questions. Uh, we have the answers. And uh, with that, I guess I'm going to pass on, since everybody's keen to know more, we're going to pass it on. I'm, I'm going to pass it on to Louise. Um, Louise, can you, you'll talk about applying gender lens to investment processes? Uh, yeah, I'm gonna. Um, I think uh, Lee and, and Goldie did a great job. So I'm, we're gonna double click. I'm gonna remind you of these three entry points, and I'm gonna take advantage and answer Santona. And I'm sorry if I'm not saying that right. Santona's question, because she asked, uh, you know, or or or, or, or they asked uh, where where to start. So where to start on GLI, right? And what what what's the place to start? And so. Um, one, one, one message is this is a journey, right? In fact, we set out this framework as three entry points because we understand that different investors might be in different journeys and different, different stages, right? So that's why we have these three entry points. Um, and, and so it's not, they're not sequential on purpose and then there's different uh, journeys. So, but basically as you see uh, in both uh, Calvert's case and in, uh, in, in Maine's case, uh, there was a commitment and a commitment from the top at some point. And then they started, right? And nine, you know, and they've, they've evolved in their thinking and it's been a process and we've been helping Maine through that process. And Maine is obviously at the earlier stage in their, in their journey and Calvert is more advanced. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing that they both did was define what gender lens investing meant for them, right? And which of these entry points they want to focus on and, and then within that, what it meant for them. And then they started taking action. Um, I know that's very basic. Um, but uh, a couple of things that we'll highlight very quickly. Um, if we double click on uh, the applying a general lens across the investment process. So as, as you, you, know, you go through this journey, there's a lot of things you can do. And all of this, it's gonna look overwhelming and it's in the how-to guide we've shared with you. There's a lot more detail. Uh, but basically what it is, it's, it's, it's just if you, if you look at it, there's five summary of five steps across the investment process going from deal origination to uh, impact measurement and exit. And uh, I'm just gonna highlight some examples of what a couple of investors have done in some of these. Um, so um, if we look at evaluation and due diligence, Root Capital, which is uh, an investor, a uh, partner of investing in women um, that invest in agribusinesses and co cooperatives, normally that are looking to export such as coffee cooperatives. Um, they're a partner of value for women as well. And they've also had a journey. And what they did uh, in their due diligence process was define what a gender inclusive business was for them. And in their case, it meant having at least 20% of women on board and leadership and 30% in the membership of cooperatives because in agriculture and agribusiness, they found that those were, uh, those were numbers that were transformative that were gonna push the needle. And then they, uh, you know, and, and, and that's how they started. And now they're thinking, okay, how do we go beyond that? And how do we think about gender inclusiveness within the, within the business? Um, and they provide, and then for, for, for businesses that are gender inclusive, it's not, uh, you know, it's not a requirement to just invest in gender inclusive businesses, but it does add points. And there are some financial incentives related to businesses that have that gender inclusiveness. Um, Okay. At least I think you need to uh, advance the slide. <clears throat> sorry, so you're not seeing the by the gender lens uh, in the no, it's process? No, it's stuck on Calvert's uh, last slide. Oh, um, I don't know what to do. Okay. That has it changed now? No. Okay. Um, okay. Well, gotta use the imagination. Um, so give me one moment and I'll, okay, I see what happened. Let me know if that worked. Yes. Okay, great. Okay. So anyway, but ending here, so that, that's one example for due diligence. Um, and then the, and so, so you didn't even see this slide that seemed overwhelming. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
So anyway, here's the slide. And, and so again, the how-to guide is gonna pro provide you with more information on this that we developed, uh, the how-to guide that we developed with investing in women. Um, and then the other thing I wanna say, pre and post deal engagement. That can be as uh, we have, we work with partners that are technical, uh, that, that provide technical assistance facilities um, for their investees uh, to hire people like Value for Women or other consultants to think about gender lens investing in their businesses. But it could also be as simple as doing something like what Maine is doing, which is creating kind of like a, a, a form of uh, sexual harassment policies and non-discrimination policies and providing that to their uh, to their investees so that they, they, they have somewhere to start uh, when they're thinking about these issues. Um, so it could, it, you know, it could be a lot of different things. Um, okay. So to recap, um, there is no cookie cutter approach. Um, and, uh, and something I didn't mention is, of course, all of this needs to be measured. Um, and, uh, and so census segregated data is very important. Um, and so we need to move beyond just, but we need to move beyond just counting women um, to thinking about how we change the processes and uh, that investors work with and the business. Um, now, um, we're a little short for time, and so we're going to go into our breakout groups, and we're going to go through an exercise that, uh, the goal here is just to talk about some of the issues that we've, we've talked about. So, you're going to be sent to a series of breakout rooms, and we're going to have a discussion, then we're going to come back, uh, we're going to share briefly, and then, and then we're going to close the session. So um, you're about to be sent to those groups. So just accept, click on accept uh, the group once you're sent to it. And the questions we're gonna be answering are, what are three actionable things you can do in your work based on what you learned today? We are all back from the breakout rooms. Yes, I think. Chloe. Yes, Louise, yeah. are you back too? I can see you. Yes, uh, Louise. Yeah, yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, yeah, so shall we, uh, I think our group really had a, a nice discussion, lots of really interesting points, but um, I think it'll be great to, to hear, uh, I know we have a few minutes, so um, I can quickly report in for my group, and then if, if you all can also talk about what happened in yours, or one person can just highlight the key points, that'll be fantastic. Um, Louise, we are seeing this really screen into screen into screen from your end. <laughs> um, great. I, I, I'm just going to start and see if, if others, uh, Louise and others wanted to add in as well. I think uh, we had some great points we heard from our group. Uh, just start on the journey, make some mistakes, make your first mistake and figure out how what you want to do about gender lens investing. Um, we uh, a participant in our group talked about building a shared vision, a shared understanding of uh, within the organization of what that means. And um, one of our participants talked about designing metrics to ensure uh, that we are doing, uh, we're going beyond just counting women, uh, which is hard to do, but also sort of looking at something that's more industry specific. And um, we had some B talk about uh, how in impact investing work, you want to create gender balanced workplaces, not just for compliance, but also um, convince people of the business case. Uh, so I'm going to stop there and see, Louis, if you had more points to add there from your group and then see if AVP. Yeah, team. no, I think I think there was there was just some talk about about thinking about uh, how to apply this in, in their work. And, and I think uh, uh, one, one issue that came out was um and Goldie was just saying about how uh you know it, 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 it you know the, the work is hard there, there, there's work that, that that involves convincing um a lot of different and then a lot of different uh there's a lot of interest and I think there's a lot going on and we're going to have different AVPN members share some of their work and videos that are coming up um and yeah I'll leave it at that uh but I think to know there's a lot of interest and I think there's different organizations, the different members are talking about starting their journey or they're already on, on their journey. Um, so not as many beginners as we thought. I'd say from my group, we echo some of the same thoughts, um, but I'd like to add um, 
the, the topic of having a diversity of voices to provide different perspectives. And sometimes within the gender lens community, that means making sure men are really included in the conversation as well. And it's not just all kind of women, women's perspectives. Thanks, Jenna. Yeah, just given where we are on time, uh, I think just a quick recap that um, I, I guess we've gone through the definition, we've got some basic understanding, we've looked and heard several examples uh, from the sector, and we've also talked a little bit about what each of us can individually do and you uh, and your organizations can do to get started on this journey if you haven't already. Um, and I think um, it's, it's good to remember that gender lens investing isn't a sector, but it's, it's, it's really part of a deal. It's not a process, not, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a process, sorry, not a, a moment in time where you just sort of flick the light switch on, right? It's an art, it's not a science. It's, there's no single way to do gender lens investing. Uh, I think Liz put it really well in our group, you have to try it out, you have to make mistakes and you have to learn from them. Uh, and there's definitely need for more data, more evidence that can convince uh, your organizations, but also others around you, the different stakeholders that matter. Um, so I guess we're going to stop at that and hand it back to AVPN. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, just to quickly chime in on what my group said and then I'll, I'll, I'll close this. Um, so uh, our group uh, thought that um, the key challenges involved the hidden biases uh, that sometimes uh, are precisely made to be hidden because of how proud we can be about our gender parity achievements in, in this uh, part of the world, at least relatively speaking. And so we thought that um, in order to address that, um, uh, developing partnerships with like-minded organizations will be helpful. Uh, another is to simply have that open discussion uh, in order to mainstream and socialize colleagues into uh, gender, uh, gender discussions and uh, into gender lens investing. Um, so with that, um, thank you very much. Uh, let me say thank you, first of all, to Value for Women, a fantastic workshop you curated for us today. Um, and to our partners, uh, Investing in Women and uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of the Australian Embassy. Um, we would like to thank all of you for taking the time this morning. And uh, we look forward to uh, being with you on the third uh, part of this series this month. Uh, we'll be showcasing women-led enterprises uh, next week. Um, and that's it from our end. Uh, thank you once again. Um, this is uh, Arnil Paras. I am the uh, AVPN representative uh, from the Philippines, as well as uh, Asian Institute of Management faculty member. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>